of stage lighting. In the last section, we considered the functions of stage lighting as a basis for a good lighting design for a theater production. In this section, we will take a look at the controllable factors of stage lighting and see how the lighting designer manipulates these to serve a play production. In service of the functions of stage lighting, one of the controllable factors of stage lighting a designer considers is intensity. The intensity of light, that is to say the relative brightness or dimness of light, can be controlled in several ways. When we spoke of the functions of stage lighting, we said that the visibility of a production is affected by the intensity of light. If the light directed into an area is too bright or too dim, it will cause eye strain on the audience. Within the range of eye-friendly intensity, the designer will want to control the intensity also to affect the overall mood, focus, and composition as well. In our example of the thunderstorm in the last section, the intensity of light can be brought up and down to create the illusion of a power surge. The most common way of controlling the intensity of light for a theater production is through the use of dimmers. Like the simple dimmers you may find on lamps in your home, a dimmer is used to carefully control intensity of light on stage. There are typically several banks of dimmers that are used to control the intensity of different areas on the stage. These dimmers are controlled by a lighting console or a light board, as it is often referred. The light board has a sequence of dimming sliders that can be used to raise or lower the intensity of a selected area on the stage. Today's lighting consoles are often computer-driven or have computer memory to control the intensity and the rate of time at which the intensity changes. Another important controllable factor of light is color. Pure white light contains all of the colors of the rainbow. In order to control the colors in white light, we need to be able to filter out the colors we don't want. The device most commonly used to do this is referred to as a gel. The gel, short for the technical term gelatin, which refers to the technique used to create gels, is a thin, flexible sheet which can be placed in a frame, which is then placed in a frame holder and directly put in front of a light beam in a lighting instrument. The gel filters out all of the colors of the white light with the exception of the color of the gel itself. The lighting designer can use the light color wheel to mix the different colors of light on a stage space. He should be well versed in understanding how the mixing of colors will create a new color. Further, he must understand how light color will also affect the color of a surface. Where the pigment color wheel has red, yellow, and blue as primary colors, the light color wheel has red, green, and blue as its primary colors. As you can see from this light model, the mixture of two primary colors will create the secondary colors of light, yellow, magenta, and cyan. A mixture of all three primary colors will create pure white light. A lighting designer can also control the direction of light. When we spoke of early American theater, we talked about how one of the major advancements in lighting came when David Belasco removed the footlights from the front of the stage and hung lighting instruments from above. The footlights had the lights shine on the actors from a low angle, and the result was a very unnatural composition on the face. You may have experienced this yourself in your youth when you held a flashlight under your chin on Halloween to create an eerie-looking expression. Since Belasco wanted the stage to appear natural, he decided that hanging the stage lights above the actors would create an effect that would be closer to everyday experience. This theory was taken even further in the 1930s when a teacher at the Yale School of Drama by the name of Stanley McCandless went to work devising a method of stage lighting that is still in use today. The McCandless method of stage lighting suggests that the most natural light and shadow patterns on the human face can be created by directing three lighting instruments into an acting area. One instrument should be directed at a 45 degree angle above and to the right of the actor. 
Another should be directed at the actor from a 45 degree angle above and to the left of the actor. And the third light should be directed at 45 degrees above and directly in front of the actor. It's from this basic arrangement that lighting designers will either observe or depart from depending on what effect they want the lighting angles to have. Another of the important controllable factors of stage lighting is the shape of the light. The standard shape that a light beam takes is a round spot. This is so that individual spots can be blended together to create what is referred to as a stage wash. But there are times when the shape of a light must be changed for either technical or aesthetic reasons. One of the ways to control the shape of light is through the use of shutters. Some instruments, like the ellipsoidal spotlight, have shutters installed in the instrument themselves. These are typically used to change the shape of the spot so that the light will not spill onto an element of the stage that would cause the light to be distracting. There are other shutters in stage lighting. One of the most common is the barn door. This is a device that may be placed in the gel frame of a light instrument and then may be manipulated to control the shape of the light. Another device that is used to control the shape of a light is referred to as a snoot or a top hat for obvious reasons. Perhaps the device most used for aesthetic purposes is referred to as a gobo. The gobo is often made of sheet metal and it has a pattern cut into it. By controlling the shape in this way, a designer can create a starry night on a cyclorama. They can also create a sense of texture on a surface by utilizing a gobo. The most familiar use of the gobo is the Batman comics where the bat signal is used to summon the superhero. Finally, a lighting designer can also control the movement of the lights. The most common way of doing this is to light specific areas of the stage independently and then raise the intensity of one part of the stage and then lower another. With a technique known as a crossfade, the one illuminated area of the stage can be lowered while raising the dim area of the stage. The result will be that the audience's attention will shift from one part of the stage to another by virtue of the movement of the intensity. A special effects version of this movement is referred to as a chase. This occurs when the intensity of lights are increased from one area to another in rapid succession. You may have seen this done at dance clubs. Another traditional way in which light can move is through an instrument referred to as a follow spot. The follow spot is an instrument that sets on a stand and then can pivot and move with a moving object on stage. The spotlight is most often used in a musical to highlight the singer as they move from one part of the stage to another. So it's the lighting designer's ability to manipulate the controllable factors of stage light in the service of the functions of stage lighting that allows him to create a practical and aesthetically pleasing light design. Well, that's all the time we have for lighting theory. It's time to go to your task for this section. When we come back, we'll take a look at the lighting instruments that are used to accomplish these theories. See you next time.